did this ourselves. They're coming. It can't be. Where is everyone? Hello, survivors, and welcome to the Apocalypse Post. I'm your host, Makeshift, and I've got a very special guest with me on the show today. He's a Mad Max car builder, set designer, YouTuber, filmmaker, and you may know him in the wastes as Captain Crunch. Welcome to the show, Paul Miller. Hey, Makeshift. Hey, Thanks for how's having it going? me on. Oh, thanks so much for being here and working through all my kinks as we get set up for the yeah. podcast today. I'm a kinky guy, so we'll get through this. <laughs> awesome. Oh, man, I can't wait. I'm so glad to be able to talk to you because um, you've been involved in Wasteland um, for, I think, as long as I have, probably a little bit longer. Um, can you tell me like how you got involved in Wasteland Weekend and, um, and uh, just a little bit about what, what you do out there? Absolutely. Um, back uh, before any of these events uh, took place, I owned a Mad Max Interceptor. So when the first iteration of the event, which was uh, Road Warrior Weekend, occurred, I was invited out, and uh, with my Interceptor, I, I don't, I don't know how. Uh, I would love to say my personality is what drew him to want it, want me out there, but you yeah. know, I have to be honest. It was the interceptor, <laughs> but it was a, it was a great time. And then, of course, the next year is when Wasteland Weekend came to be. Um, I still had the interceptor and was invited out then. And um, very soon after, I don't remember what year it would be, um, but I became the vehicle coordinator for Wasteland Weekend. Oh, yeah, that's um, right. Yeah, so that's really how I got involved with the event. Um, and, you know, I have to say, you know, looking back, those early years were, were just amazing. Not, not to put down anything that's happening now, but just being a smaller event. Um, I, you know, I got to know uh, the car builders a little bit more intimately. And yeah. um, it was just, it was a great time back then. And I'll be honest, uh, I think I retired from the... Uh, doing the car stuff as far as a coordinator, it was either 2014 or 2015. And uh, now with the amount of vehicles at Wasteland Weekend, um, you know, kudos to the guys that pull it off now because I don't think I could do it. it. It's just gotten that huge. It's um, wonderful. But back yeah. in the day when I did it, it was a little bit less. Of course, you know, I adopted a boat instead, and that was the, <laughs> a whole new tangent in Wasteland Weekend that I went on. So. Yeah, and um, so back then, back in like 2009, uh, Road Warrior Weekend was 2009. Wasteland Weekend started 2010. Back then, like how many vehicles were showing up? Uh, let's see, at, at uh, Road Warrior Weekend, I would guess we had maybe 10, maybe 15 uh, yeah. cars that showed up in various uh, degrees of dress. And I could be wrong. Um, I'll be honest. I stayed one day. That was back <laughs> when, uh, that event was in October and I think it was late October. And I have to say it was cold that night. Oh, I, yeah, thought, I heard that I had thought about staying over, thought about sleeping in the car and you know, those Mad Max leathers look good. They do not retain heat, at least not what I was wearing. <laughs> so, um, so I didn't get the full effect of seeing all the cars, I don't believe, because I know Sunday there was there's more stuff going on. But uh, there wasn't a lot. And, um, you know, certainly the first few years, uh, you know, we, we slowly amped it up. And I would say about the time I retired is when just a lot of builders, you know, Wasteland Weekend was just, you know, more on people's radar. Yeah. And there were more builders and, and just amazing uh, vehicles. Um, there, there's stuff that's been created, as you know. I, you know, for me as a car builder, I, I can't uh, conceive how they came up with it. It's just some amazing creativity. <laughs> yeah. How many cars do, would you say? Um, well, well, vehicles in general, because it's not just cars anymore, right? It's like there's motorcycles and there's go karts and there's like people uh, taking radio flyers and motorizing them. Uh, how many vehicles would you say show up to the event now? I want to say there was over 150 last year. Uh, there's yeah, people who right. would know better than I, but, you know, definitely over 100. And just, yeah, there is a lot of machinery to look at. And, and as you just pointed out, a lot of different ideas out there. You know, yeah. uh, one guy's driving a coffin. And, you know, <laughs> and then there, there was another guy just a, did a great at Fallout inspired vehicle. Right. It just, it, it, it is, I think, the lifeblood of that community. And when I say that, 
in the wasteland community, I'm also talking costumes and camps, right. all of that. It's really, uh, you know, beyond God knows the, the people and their heart and their passion, but the creativity, I think, is what really, for me, drives the event. Um, yeah. It's always exciting to, to just know you're going to run up out there and see something new and different. No kidding. And um, all right. So you're a movie guy. Uh, you've got quite a bit of experience on set. What would you say is the major difference between a vehicle that they make for a film and what uh, Wastelanders are bringing out What are the, and what they're creating in their backyards? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll say this sometimes I think and most of the times I think the Wastelanders are coming up with something more creative. Um <laughs> I would say, you know, for for the film, I mean, there's two things. There's a lot more money in the film, uh-huh. uh, films. There's also a lot more uh, hands in the pie. In other words, there's more people telling uh, a, a creator, a builder, what they want. Yeah. Uh, where a wastelander or, or someone such as myself can say, okay, you know, I, I'm going to mount a Cessna on the chassis and <laughs> throw some machine guns on it, and I'm just going to roll with it. Yeah. Where where the film business, there's a lot more things to be answered to, uh, you know, certainly safety and role, you know, and it also, of course, depends on what they're asking the vehicle to do. Right. Um, but there's also uh, a lot of movie cars really are built just to survive the movie. Right. Um, and, and I think where, where Wasteland cars are probably built uh, a little bit stronger because we're beating the hell out of them and a lot of those vehicles are daily drivers or uh-huh. you know and i know i built some stuff where i could take off my armor and my wasteland stuff and then put it back on when it was time for wasteland so oh yeah you know there's there's a lot of differences in, in that respect but ultimately i would say that movie cars are far more expensive but they're also really not meant to last yeah, and I'm not talking uh-huh. all of them, but certainly there are some in the medium and low budget films, especially where they're just trying to get through the show. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, there was one wasteland where I believe uh, an actual movie car showed up. Like I think I think it was a Mad Max movie car. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was a it was actually a Mad Max game when the game was coming out. The a company uh, and I don't recall the name of the company built a car for promo, yeah. and. Um, and so they brought that out. I'm trying to think if there's any other movie vehicles. I think that's the one I'm thinking of. And I remember um, several uh, Wasteland uh, Black Thumbs actually made the comment that this movie car, this promo car, was a lot of styrofoam, whereas Wastelander cars are like real metal, real rust, real parts. Did, exactly. Do you remember? Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> a- absolutely. And, and that's uh, you, usually the case across the board with movie cars also. Um, it's just quicker to make like that that giant grill guard that they, they made and it was influenced from the game, um, both in terms of weight in actual work put in, it was, I imagine, just a lot quicker yeah. to carve out a styrofoam. And ca- whether they actually just painted the styrofoam, which is the real cheap, quick way, and they uh-huh. might have done that. There's also coatings you can put on styrofoam. Or for me, um, you know, I'm building uh, my Wasteland Mercury, which I brought out in 2013, 2014. Uh-huh. Um, that car is now being changed over to more of a movie car for something I'm doing. And I'm doing a lot of carving styrofoam and then doing fiberglass pieces. So oh, wow. yeah, it's, it's more of a look in the film biz as opposed to wasteland, which, you know, uses real stuff. You know, yeah. Guys aren't afraid to throw big hunking pieces of metal on a real <laughs> tough bumper and just drive around the desert with it so yeah and with movies you know you need to be able to take a do a second take and so sometimes you need to be able to swap out a damaged part for a fresh one so you can do it again whereas wasteland cars the more they get damaged uh you want it to stay damaged (laughs) yep exactly in fact i made uh molds of my front and back bumper my merc just for that reason i know that i might have damage when i'm filming and i need to have a replacement and once again that stuff's real quick even i mean if i had a big giant metal bumper on the car just the time it would take to replace a big heavy thing now you got four people have to do a job that i can throw a fiberglass bumper on the car you know alone so that you know there is a lot of differences ultimately you know film versus wasteland cars ultimately both I appreciate because uh-huh. both are telling stories and and they have a designer's aesthetic and that type of thing. 
but I'll be honest, I'm more partial to Wastelanders than the vehicles they built. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the right tool for the right job. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, not only have you worked in the movie biz, but you're also a filmmaker yourself. So, um, one of the first times that we actually met was uh, at the premiere of your short film, Mad Max Renegade. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us about that and how it uh, came about? Uh, well, Mad Max Renegade, um, I, I have to think back. Okay, so the truth of the matter is I not, not only owned one Interceptor, I actually owned <laughs> two Interceptors. So It's a problem. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's an addiction is what it is. Uh-huh. I'll be honest, the first one I got, uh, I am a car guy, and I do enjoy um, solid vehicles as opposed to rust buckets, and that's not putting anybody down that has a rust bucket car. It's uh-huh. just that you know the Ford Falcon, Australian Ford Falcon, is a muscle car, um, and I wanted a solid car, and I was sold a car that was far from it and started really <laughs> having some issues. And at the same time, someone offered to buy it. Uh-huh. And um, it was, you know, it was an appropriate amount of money. So I, I did sell it and instantly had seller's remorse. Oh, and wow. I had belonged to some of the Mad Max car groups. And uh, a, another one uh, came up for sale in Australia that was solid. And I just happened to be in a situation at that time where I had the finances to do it. Uh-huh. And I did it. And, you know, I had it shipped over. <laughs> now, the interesting thing about that, that whole process, the first one I had bought was shipped, but I was very naive about the process. Then I was told that, you know, those containers fall off the ships a lot. What? And in fact, you can go on YouTube and, and see those container ships and just the containers toppling oh, off yeah. into the ocean. I've so, seen something like that. Yeah, and I'm biting my nails, waiting, because the ship, for some reasons I don't understand, was way late in getting into port. Oh wow! You know, I'm supposed to have it in I don't remember what month May, and it it didn't get there till June. So I you know I know in my heart that that car went under because it was a <laughs> solid solid car, and uh, but sure enough it did arrive. So Good. I you know started uh you know playing with it, and uh, I actually and it's 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 sad it was never never saw the light of day, but there was a time when the original Fury Road was going to shoot. I want to say in 2009. Uh-huh. And I was actually hired to go out with my interceptor and film a, you know, like one of those DVD commentary type of things. Uh-huh. And uh, it was actually filmed. And unfortunately, as you know, Fury Road got delayed. And for right. whatever reason, that video never came to light. Oh, what a uh, shame. But it was it was pretty cool. I, I'll be honest. I was a huge fat tub of lard at that time. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm terribly thin now, but I was big back then. And I saw the guys kind of showed me some of the stuff uh, months later. And it was quite embarrassing to see me. And I had, you know, the tight leather. Out. Oh, geez. It just <laughs> never. So there's a side of me that's very happy. That thing never saw the light of day. But But what happened in the process of filmmaking, I discovered the location, which is very close to California City. Uh-huh. where they were filmed, you know, where we filmed. I thought, wow, this is a great location to do a little short film. Nice. And I just had the idea for Mad Max Renegade uh, um, and took my Interceptor out, got some good friends. Um, good friend Liam came out. He was my actor. He kind of looks like Mel Gibson. Uh, he helped yeah. finance it. The goal was actually to to send uh, the film to uh, George Miller. And this is way before Fury Road was done because of all their delays. Right. Um, but, you know, Liam did a fantastic job. And, uh, you know, we had fun. I had a buddy with a yellow Mustang that we dressed up post-apocalyptic. Uh-huh. And we filmed... I want to say we filmed most of the action first and then with, through editing, I realized there was more of a story there and we went out. So it took about two years to do the film just because oh, wow. we, we went back and shot the other, I, I want to say half. It wasn't half like one first half, second half. It was more like, Hey, we can add stuff to this film and actually give it, give it some heart. And nice. uh, I, I invite everybody who hasn't seen it. Uh, Mad Max Renegade is on YouTube and uh, yeah, check it out. It's a it's a fun little homage to you know films that really inspired me to become a filmmaker, and um, I, I, I'm proud of the film. And it is a little a little history, a little Mad Max history. Yeah, uh, and it, it takes place between Mad Max and the Road Warrior, right? Exactly. 
Exactly. Yeah. So, so you're actually filling in some character gaps between the two movies. I, I remember um, something about the shoulder pad and and um, the dog. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's funny. I did give uh, when when uh, George Miller was traveling around with Fury Road. I got to meet him at the DGA, and I did give him the short film. And I, you know, never heard anything. Not not that he owes me anything, but I would love to know if it was something that he approved of. <laughs> Yeah. Or did he say, what the hell? Yeah, this isn't, uh, you know, the history. I don't know. I never, I never got a cease and desist letter. So <laughs> I guess, uh, I guess he's okay with it. Yeah, he must be right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So tell me a little bit more about that. That was what, 2016, where you got to meet George Miller. Um, how, how did that happen? And, and uh, what do you think about getting to meet him? Well, I mean, what was happening at that time, because he is obviously nominated for Academy Award, numerous awards for Fury Road. Right. So um, I belonged to the DGA. So he came in and introduced the film and then took uh, questions afterwards. And um, yeah, he just he's a great guy. He he didn't mind meeting anybody he stayed after. And then I'd also gone to a screening with Liam. Um where he also spoke and Liam and I went down. I, I do have to say this and I feel horrendous about it. I was taking a picture of Liam posing with George Miller and I don't know <laughs> if I got bumped or whatever, but it's a terribly blurry picture. And Liam, you know, he, oh, no. you know, he dreamed of course, as all of us big Mad Max road warrior fans uh, do of meeting, meeting his idol and, here the poor guy has this one blurry <laughs> oh, no. photo. And uh, I, I I think I've apologized profusely to him. Uh, Liam, if I haven't, dude, I'm still horrendously sorry. I'm sorry, too. <laughs> oh, man. I, you know, and, and with my Photoshop abilities, I have thought about putting his uh, – his head on to my body when I was standing next to George, <laughs> which is clear, but I just don't think it has the same effect, but, oh, I, but it was no. great. It was great meeting him. Like I said, it was, it was cool hearing the stories. Um, yeah. so, uh, and he definitely, the road warrior to this day, as much as I like Fury road and uh, the road warrior is, will always be my most favorite uh, film of all time. When I saw that, that really, you know, blew me away, and and as obviously many of the Wasteland Weekend participants and fans of the movies, I mean, it was right. that impactful that it it did actually uh, make me decide I want to work in the film business and that type of thing. So awesome! Yeah, I, I talked in an earlier um, episode of the podcast that uh, the Road Warrior was actually my first Mad Max movie. Plus, it was my first like post apocalypse movie ever. But I I my parents friend actually showed it to me when I was probably like eight, nine or 10 or something like that. So I was, I was a little, a little early <laughs> for, for the content, but, um, but man, it, what a, what a great movie to have as your introduction to the Mad Max world. Yeah. And I, I I'm debating on if I should uh, share this story. In fact, I might ask you to cut it out of the podcast <laughs> after I do, but there was, there was probably another reason why it was my favorite movie. I won't go into details, but I had a girlfriend at the time, uh -huh. and it was a Saturday, and I'd gone over to um, to, to visit her. Mm -hmm. And we were, I mean, we had dated oh, quite a few years, but we were very good kids. We didn't, you know, mess around physically and that type of thing. Uh -huh. And uh, so I don't know why. On this particular mor morning, she decided that, yeah, I really shouldn't be telling this story. <laughs> she wanted to to see it. I mean, that's that was her exact word. She goes, can I see it? Hey, survivors, I'm going to jump in here real quick. Paul goes on to tell me an absolutely hysterical story where he gets caught in a very compromised position. It's a fun sidebar, but I wanted to keep this postcast on topic. However... If you want to hear the rest of the story, I'm going to post it on my Patreon page so everyone can hear about why Paul's first time seeing The Road Warrior was just so unforgettable. You do need to be a patron, though, to listen, which you can do that for as little as a dollar an upload. All the money raised through the Patreon just goes right back into the Apocalypse Post YouTube channel and this show. As always, I thank you all for your support. Now, let's get back to it. 
So, um, yeah, let's go back to Wasteland. Tell me about your early years at Wasteland. Um, before the D's was even, um, be- even a dream. Um, what was your character? Did you have a tribe? Like what, how did you Wasteland? I, you know, when I f- originally started Wastelanding, I was the loner. Um, mm-hmm. I, I can't say I had any, my, my feeling was my cars, my, uh, outfit. Yeah. Um, most of the time, if you saw pictures of me in the early years, the first, I think two years, I was just in a black sweatshirt. Oh, I remember, I remember one day I actually had a Dukes of Hazard orange, bright orange t-shirt with the old one on the, you know, and cut off sleeves. Um, I would be kicked right out of Wasteland now, <laughs> but the first few years they were, you know, kind of feeling it out themselves. There weren't really yeah. camps. You know, they're dealing you know, for the first three years there. You'd be lucky if you'd find a tent that was decorated. There's a few groups that right. started up, but for those first few years, it was a lot more lax, but I was definitely a loner, didn't have a tribe. Um, and you know, oftentimes I was busy either with the car, you know, car show thing or, right. or just driving around in, in the intercept. And of course, everybody loved seeing it. So it, right. it, they didn't really, you know, care whether I was nearby or not. I'm not <laughs> saying that negatively. Um, but I will say this for wastelanders that maybe are, are loners that maybe have done it for a few years. Um, I found yeah after a few years and i I stumbled on it by mistake you know um and we can we'll touch on that when we start talking about the d's and the swimsuit contest and all that but but essentially because of how things happened yeah i wasn't looking for a tribe i wasn't looking to build a tribe Uh it it kind of happened but i will say for those that maybe have gone solo for a number of years and maybe are because i was at a point at that time where i was starting to uh, lose interest in a way because it was the same old same old Uh um and that's nothing negative against the people or of the creativity or the event it's just i was doing the same thing and i at that time you know i had my merc out there which was which was fun Um, but yeah so here i am all of a sudden because of how things uh, transpired in regards to the d's i had a tribe yeah and and was leading a tribe and it really opened up my wasteland world and my wasteland life. Um, just because now I was interacting with people of like minds. Yeah. And, um, and then, you know, it's funny cause I've worked in film business all my life. So you're, it's always a collaborative type of thing. Right. Um, but for some reason I didn't like put that forward as, as far as wasteland. So once I su- suddenly had these people that we kind of had a light goal my my time at Wasteland was much more fulfilling. I, I really, uh, truly enjoyed um, more so than when I was solo uh, going to the events and for the you know the months of building that we did and that type of thing where we all got together as a group and right. you know became a family. And of course, there's pitfalls with families and tribes too. I mean, they're not it's not all roses. It's challenging, <laughs> um, but ultimately. It was very, very, very rewarding to uh, to have a tribe and have people who are committed to a you know a very similar goal. Which in and I'm very proud to say this. In fact, I almost getting a little uh, lump in my throat. You mm-hmm. know, our goal when it came to the D's was to entertain, and awesome. um, I, I, I truly believe that we were successful in that goal, um, and. Uh, and I can say that, you know, almost all the tribe members all had the same goal. We all just wanted to, I mean, sure, we wanted to have fun. But, you know, that day when we were were doing the show, it was, uh, it was, <laughs> anyway, I'm jumping forward. Yeah, yeah, no worries. <laughs> but, but, but like I said, but like I said, in the olden days, I was a loner, no costume. I think uh, uh-huh. a good friend of mine, Curtis, uh, gave me some shoulder pads once. I think he's just so embarrassed. <laughs> Going, dear God, you know, put this on. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and um, let me see, even in the Merc, I, I wore the shoulder pads in the Merc. Uh-huh. And but even then, it wasn't until I got into uh, the uh, the D's tribe or that came about. And then uh, my good friend Alonzo uh, makes these great pieces of wardrobe. I, I cannot claim any 
talent in the wardrobe department. I Uh really am not that great. But Alonzo is amazing. Alonzo Garcon, and he just made some great outfits for me. And and, uh, so so I cannot take any credit for actually looking Wasteland for any of the years I've been out there because it's always been other people dressing me. (laughs) Kind of like, you know, a knife toting gun carrying mom dressing me with wasteland gear is what what it was like yeah well you know uh and alonzo has his brand it's called the the hand of garcon he's yep. got a whole great story about it he's actually super talented but he doesn't use um what a sewing machine he does everything by hand exactly exactly and so uh, i mean it's got to take that much longer but it means that it's that much more wasteland too yeah, and he he does it with love and affection too. He just <laughs> loves doing it. Uh, he did a great outfit for Waffle, um, Mike Waffle, which is my second command. I mean, essentially, yep. you know, the fir- the original three was Mike Orr, Mike Waffle, and myself, as far as <laughs> as the D's. And yeah. uh, Alonzo made this great great outfit because uh, in uh, you may recall in 2015 we bought brought out the Borderlands Bandit technical. Uh-huh. Yeah. which is not a post-apocalyptic film or uh, game. And they let us, uh, I think, until 2017. I think we're out there for three years dressed up as Borderlands characters. No robots, but, uh-huh. you know. And uh, then 2017, I think, is when they said, okay, guys, that's it. Yeah, cool which, it off a little. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't mind it. It, it. I mean, some of the people were a little pissed off. I'm like, dude, I mean, this isn't a post-apocalyptic world. It's a sci-fi world. So we changed our vehicle over and gave it some nautical feel. We put some bow rails on it. But uh-huh. one of the places we, you know, I had my outfit pretty quick, uh, the Captain Crunch outfit. But uh, Waffle, who rides on the hood, and we love, always loved him up there as a psycho bandit. Because Waffle is, when he dressed up like psycho bandit, he was one. And, and <laughs> great photos of him just leering over and doing all the stuff that's in the game um for you know video people and uh so we wanted a costume that had the same impact but we wanted an article and you know alonzo you know he's he's making fish scale like things and <laughs> you know goggles and, and he's using uh you know dive suits and I, just he really is a creative powerhouse i i really enjoy the stuff that he did and he doesn't just do costumes he's a, a really cool painter and you know, I have a lot of a lot of respect for him, but m- maybe more importantly, the fact that he dressed me and made me look cool, I nice. always <laughs> always appreciate. Yeah, no kidding. It's 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 interesting because um, a lot of wastelanders um do a little bit of everything, but I think we all it's also important to know that there's a lot of specialists. There's guys like you that work on vehicles and set pieces. There's people that just work on costumes and and um and then there's people that really work on their camps and you yep. know it's, so it's it's like this. You, you can't do it all. <laughs> so that's where like tribes come in uh, really helpful where, you know, you're kind of rounding out each other's skills. And especially when it comes to costuming, like I don't feel like I'm a great costumer either. Um, but that's where like barter town really comes in handy. There's this shop outside of wasteland, kind of like downtown Disney before you enter to go to the mm-hmm. castle, you got to yeah. go buy all these stores. Right. And um, you can buy pretty much an entire costume on your way in. And because it's wasteland stuff, like we're talking dollars, not hundreds of dollars. <laughs> yeah, that is. I mean, that's one of the the things that has happened in Wasteland Weekend that's fantastic is availability of stuff like that. During the early years, we, you know, two or three years, we didn't have anything like that. And then right. you know, vendors started coming in and doing that. Uh, Walmart being one that and Alonzo was uh-huh. associated with them. Uh, for a while. And uh, so, yeah, that has, and one would think that I would have migrated over to those places, <laughs> but no, 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 no <laughs> not, not until Curtis threw a shoulder pads at me and said, wear this, that I yeah. realized, hmm, maybe I do need to up my game a little yep. bit, and, you know? <laughs> yeah. All right. So I do want to um, talk a little bit more about the D's. Um, so uh, the D stage ended up being one of the biggest uh, and earliest large scale installations at wasteland weekend can you describe it um you know because we're audio only can you describe what it looks like and tell us what events um have been hosted on it throughout the years yeah i actually uh if you don't mind i'm gonna go back to where it all began because it yeah i was just thinking about it today you know preparing for this interview is i don't understand why uh it it landed on my shoulders (laughs) 
<laughs> and I'm not saying that negatively. Um, and I may, I believe, yes, our, our the the first swimsuit slash wet t-shirt contest at that time I did was in 2014. Mm -hmm. So in 2013, I was walking, I think it was uh, Mike or I and Mike Waffle were walking by a contest that was happening outside of the wall. You know, this is out in just the camping area and it was a t-shirt contest and whatever. And, and, um, I, I think we stumbled upon it. We didn't go there to watch or whatever. We just found Uh it. We, We watched and moved on. And then, so in somewhere, I would say probably three, four, five months after uh, 2013, I got a, I believe it was a Facebook message from one of the people of that tribe, one of the young ladies who uh-huh. ran that that contest and say, hey, we're, I believe they weren't going to make it to Wasteland Weekend in 2014, I think is okay. what it was, if memory serves me right, which, you know, it may not, but I think I'm pretty close, uh, but she couldn't make it. And she asked me if I wanted to take over the swimsuit contest. And there's only one answer for that. <laughs> yeah. I, I said, thank you. I, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, I was trying to try to think of a, a way to put, but yeah, I'm a normal guy and it, it's fun to see attractive and, when, and women in suits. And um, mm-hmm. I'm trying to, I don't even know. I think 2014, we may not, it may not have had any men in that one, in that contest. Now that I think I, I about think that's it. That's right. Yeah, and we had I think ten or fifteen contestants, and it and we we just built this little tiny dock. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, one of my tribe members, Chris, mm-hmm. uh, had somehow uh, had these dock pieces, and he brought them, and we put a a pole up that was dangerous as hell. Um, uh-huh. it was, yeah, it's thank yeah, thank God no one fell. That's all I say about that. <laughs> we hooked up with a tribe. Um, and uh, I'm trying to remember the name. Oh, the Pirates of the Arid Seas was their tribe name. And they had a oh, vehicle yeah. that had a sail. So they would drive, you know, a post-apocalyptic vehicle, Jeep, I believe, with a sail. That's right. And I just hooked up with them just because of the name recognition. And I asked them, could we do this this swimsuit contest? And they were awesome and said, yes. Yeah. So that's where we did it in a camp outside of, you know, in the wasteland proper. And... Uh, after that, and it was it was a fun little event, but it was tiny. Like I said, I, yeah. maybe fifteen people in it all together, and the crowd was maybe you know double that thirty people watching. Right. Soon after that, I was told by uh, Ron Griffith there at um, in California City at Phoenix Auto. Um, I he'd uh, done a lot of work. Uh, actually, I met him back in the, that first little uh, film we did for that was never shown in the DVDs for Fury Road. Mm -hmm. I met him way back. Well, anyway, he contacted me and said, Hey, I know where the D's is. Um, Oh, wow. And what it was was his uh, son-in-law works at the Mojave airport. And that's where the D's model. And I put, if you could see me, I'm doing air quotes because the model was 117 feet long, 20 feet wide and 12 feet high. I mean, it was a, giant uh model oil tanker as you know yeah, that's, that's bigger than uh what half a football field uh, yeah it, it was big it was under a wing of a 747 which was <laughs> which is kind of odd because when you see a 747 that's even bigger and you're so you're like yeah. okay maybe that's not maybe we can handle it it's not that big i mean it's not as big <laughs> as a 747 right oh what we didn't know then um so, <laughs> so anyway uh I believe it was uh, Waffle or and I uh, went out there, met uh, met his uh, son-in-law, Chris, uh-huh. and uh, of course he brought us and showed us the ship. Now the the ship model had seen better days. Um, some of the metal had been blown off from the wind. Uh-huh. Um, some of the fiberglass uh, barnacles had crumbled. The, of course, the superstructure is all gone. Yeah. Uh, well, by this they, time it had been sitting for what twenty years almost. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and they blew up the superstructure in the movie anyway, so there was <laughs> oh, there <yeah>. was nothing. <laughs> um, and the the top was made of plywood, and that was all bending up. So, but you know, the, here's the ship. So you know, I decide. Well, Christ, we you know. So I instantly, the creative side of me kicks in and goes, "Oh, I could do something with this." That, yeah. That's what I. That's what I knew off the front. You know, but I was thinking like. Well, maybe I'll take some sheet metal and make some shacks or something with it. I, I would, did not know where to go with it. And I thought, well, I better ask him how much he wants for it. 
because uh, it, essentially it's scrap. You know, they're scrapping all the planes out there, and they had, were planning on scrapping that too. Uh-huh. So uh, I, he said, you know, I don't have a lot of money. He says, but, you know, how much do you want for, <laughs> for us to take some stuff off? He goes, uh, one. I go, one? I don't have a hundred dollars even. He goes, no, no, one dollar. One dollar. Oh my gosh. So, and then, and then I didn't have a dollar. So he said, you can pay me later. Fast forward, I think it was two or three years. And one of our, one of the tribes mates, uh, Carla, um, this story came out that I'd never give him, gave him the dollar. Oh so my Carla, God. who's beside me, whips out a dollar bill, gives it to him. And now she <laughs> says she's the owner of the boat, which uh. she still claims to this day. But, you know, there's, there's no boat now. So I guess the joke's yeah. on her. But um, <laughs> so after that, I, I did, I devised uh, the stage, which is pretty much what you saw in 2015. And it didn't change much. It didn't change at all, except for, our docks and our platforms changed, but the boat itself, um, that was the original sketch that I did. And, uh-huh. um, and that was a plan. So it was in June of, uh, 2015. So uh-huh. we had three months essentially oh to get this boat built. We went out on the hottest day of that year. It was 116 <laughs> degrees. No, Not, no exaggeration at that oh airport. Yeah. It gets hot um, up there. Oh boy, it was that was the worst I've ever been. You know, I've been up there a lot building. That was the hottest day I've yeah. ever been up there. Wow! It was uh, ten people. Uh, you know, just we just invited people, anyone who had the love of the boat or the uh-huh. movie. Um, so we had ten, maybe eleven people show up. I had brought, and Mike had brought a whole bunch of us had brought um, reciprocating saws, uh, sawzalls, and we're going to uh-huh. cut this boat apart. <laughs> so we start and. It it was obvious it, within two minutes that there is no way in hell that we are going to be able to cut this boat apart um, with these reciprocating saws. Um, the wow. metal was too thick. It, the whole interior was a tube metal frame. Oh, wow. T- tremendously overbuilt. <laughs> um, and one of the reasons, if uh, there's some stuff that you can see the behind the scenes of how they filmed it, but they lifted that boat up and put, uh, you know, supports underneath it. You know, in other words, they had to yeah. overbuild it just to keep it from bending or falling apart. But that right. said, it was a lot of metal. And, uh-huh. you know, Adam from Wasteland Weekend luckily was there and he said, you know, <laughs> You really should try uh, a belt. Uh, uh, and we got the now I'm getting the name of the device wrong. Damn it! But a saw that is um. Ah, God, see, thank you, kids. Enjoy the time being young because you don't get nearly as forgetful as you are when you get older. Anyway, a saw, band saw. There we go. It there clicks it in. It just takes a little while. So, and I didn't know, I'd used bandsaws all my life, but they're the standing ones and, and technology had obviously far past my uh, brain capacity because I didn't know their handheld ones. It's, oh yeah, and get some cutting oil. So I raced down to Home Depot in uh, Lancaster and back. Uh-huh. So two hours later, I show up with, <laughs> I think, two of these and all the oil and as many blades as I could buy. Uh-huh. And oh, the, the joy. Just it was like going through butter. So all of a sudden oh, wow. we are we are making progress cutting this thing apart. So essentially what we did, and, and while we were cutting, we cut off oh about it was square framing inside, so it was like a two foot length before you got to the the next piece of uh, parallel metal. So we cut uh-huh. off essentially the two foot of the sides of the boat from the siding back to feet originally. Oh, wow. And, uh, and then we loaded them up on flatbeds at the same time. And we decided we were only taking certain parts of the boat, but we stripped the boat of all, we took photos of everything on the boat, uh-huh. stripped the entire boat, marked all the, the back plates so that we could put the metal on to our stage as close to how it really was nice. on the ship within reason. I mean, the, the bow, <laughs> if you look at the bow on, on the D's, you know, the ship in the movie, 
it's you know bulbous on the bottom. We could not do any of that. We had to okay, really yeah. simplify our design. Uh-huh. But still, we did try to stay true and where we could take big panels of metal off because the metal, even though it was in sheets, they were stapled onto plywood or you know thin um, thin luon actually, and we could uh-huh. take big pieces off if we're lucky if the weather hadn't damaged them. So uh-huh. there are big chunks when we put the boat back together, which literally went just from the D's and got thrown right back up onto the stage, huh. which was which was great. So we just uh, tried to stay. With the overall feel of the boat when we designed, when I designed the stage and when we built it, and of course uh, we had to do alterations for the shape, but we did put the back plate that was on the D's was the original back plate from the D's in the movie, and then the side panels that say Exxon, though barely, and we could barely see them now or at the time. Oh, so um, that was the actual like printed yep. Exxon Valdez logo Ash. from the original. Yeah, actual paint. We did not retouch anything on the back plate or the side plates. Everything is was just as we took it off the boat. That is so cool. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and then it was months of me, and then, and then when whoever, whenever people were free to join me, uh, came out and b- built the boat. Uh, by that time, our crew had dwindled in, in, down to about five people, <laughs> and no, and nothing, nothing again. They had their lives to live. It wasn't of anything course. like like they didn't want to participate. The other people, yeah. it's just there are some people who I'm not going to mention names, but me were unemployed, so it was really <laughs> easy for me to go out and just work on the boat for days, and then I'd yeah. be joined on the weekend by by other people. And, and uh, where are you? Where are you doing this work? Well, you know, that uh, Ron uh, Griffith's uh, shop, uh, Phoenix Auto, had this big, or has this big parking lot, and mm-hmm. he was kind enough to let us build there. So, oh, that's so great. So, yeah, and I had a, by that time, I had a trailer I could stay in. I bought a cheap little trailer, and I just uh-huh. would crash there at nights. And, oh, wow. Uh, get up and start working. Oh, that's and, so cool. And uh, the, the boat was made boat the stage whatever was built on two trailers that i bought um and i I have to mention and for those of you listening who donated way back (laughs) when thank you very much we did fundraising to be able to make this this boat and you know it's awkward because in one way you know we're we're a tribe but we're a tribe by necessity in other words we got (laughs) to build a boat so i need people we became a tribe in the same token our goal it wasn't like oh we're going to ask for money for our tribe no that every single dime that was raised went into just buying supplies and and everything we needed to put that boat together and it would not have happened at all if um we were not for the people who donated awesome. um and oh, great. so so when that event was happening you know it, it truly was a wasteland event yeah as opposed to our tribe because right. so many people put in money and like i said people put in time to build it and it uh it was down to the wire but anyway we <laughs> we we buy these trailers um one is a boat trailer that blew two tires on the way out to California City. <laughs> but the real challenge was, you know, I, I bought, I learned a lot about those little travel trailers. Uh-huh. And the thing I learned the most about is that you have to keep the interior, you know, like the walls and all that in those campers because that's what gets it, you know, keeps it sturdy. Right. Well, I bought this trailer. Well, they had ripped out the inside. Apparently they wanted to redo it only realizing that this isn't going to work because they just took all the structural stuff out of it. So I'm dry. I am towing this thing. And it it was from, I think Downey. So I got to tow it from Downey to California city. I look in the rear view mirror and the side is flapping. It it looked like a (laughs) tail of a trout just flapping in the wind. And of course we don't have license plates on. I mean, everything was illegal about that damn thing. Uh Um, and, uh, we got it out there safely. We, I did have somebody behind me with flashers on, so we're trying to be as safe as possible, but I am glad that, you know, the police, as an example, didn't see us towing it out there, but we got it out there. And then, I would say, you know, a lot of time was spent just getting that thing shored up because, as you know, we had people on top of that. Right. So we we did a two-by-four structure, a ton of wood in it, and uh, really 
really built that part of the boat up. The other part, uh, the bow, we did use a lot of the actual interior uh, metal from the D. Okay. So it just nice. The way it just kind of fit, it was really strange. I would just wow. like, oh, cut here, cut there, weld right there. And um, yeah, it really, it, that one came together. So that was pretty hollow. We store, we did a lot of storage in both sides, obviously, when we moved it back and forth. And uh-huh. we got down, but our last year, it took one day, you know, one and a half, one day for the boat to get that up and then be another uh-huh. day to get the docks and the platforms. In. Got it. Wow. Wow. All right. Yeah. So um, describe how this thing looked when you had it kind of set up in its final position at Wasteland. Well, I would say the last year, which is 2019, the last year it was up was by far the best year. So for those of you out there who never saw it, um, essentially we made a boat wreck. Our whole idea thematically was that, yeah, a whole bunch of water uh, surrounded the earth, but then it went away. So we we were praying for more rain. That was you know our whole thing was in, until the rain comes and we can rule the sea again in our uh-huh. rusted out you know <laughs> shipwrecked boat. We're going to entertain you. That was the whole idea. That's great. And so um, I designed the boat with the bow and the stern with a big hole in the middle, and then I ran docks out. Uh-huh. Um, and then originally the first year, 2015, the docks were flat, and uh-huh. uh, we had an issue. It was pointed out that people in the back couldn't see uh-huh. the um, the performance. I mean, once right. you got five rows, eight, ten rows back. So then we decided to do platforms. So then I decided, okay, we're going to make it like not only did the ship shipwreck out in the middle of the desert, it actually was tied up to some oil uh, refinery, Derek. In other words, this is where they refilled the oil tanker. Our whole uh-huh. idea was that it's a small <laughs> oil tanker now that goes around to small boats in the bay. Oh, so nice. it was tied up to <laughs> its little. So if you look at the towers we built, there's oil pipes and there's little handles to turn on the oil. And that that's how we kind of justified platforms for guys and girls to perform on. It was not actually there for them. They actually found an oil yeah you know, they're just platform. using what was yeah, there exactly exactly <laughs> yeah. i guess when this whole thing was put together it it did not look that far off from like the water world stunt show at universal <laughs> yeah it, it it had that vibe and then that's what yeah. we always tried to to keep you know, certainly um i hung i think it was maybe it was 2015 maybe it's 2016 i hung a a dead uh chris chris fanning uh worked uh, a lot with aquarium stuff and somehow he got uh a tuna fiberglass tuna uh-huh. um and gave it to me <laughs> and also i got a swordfish i believe he's the one that gave me both i could be wrong but anyway i decided that tuna i'm going to cut it up and make it into a dead fish hanging from the boat and uh-huh. that was definitely influenced from you know universal studios and their right. big fish hanging out there so yeah, that's where awesome. that came from so there was definitely some influence in fact we had heard for years that that show was going to close down and our dream was to raid everything in it but <laughs> it never closed down but sadly the ship went away so that's yep. not going to happen yep, but so um that. But yeah, it uh, that was the whole goal is just to kind of have everything around that boat theme- themed in some kind of water world or aquatic type of thing. Our vehicles, as I mentioned, the uh, the land shark, we we turned well, that's what we called it for for our um, for our waste our water world tribe is uh-huh. the land shark as opposed to the bandit. And I put some fish symbols on it and the bow rails, a lot of fish net, and then Mike or Mike and or Warren Waffle brought out their Camaro and they, and this is, this would be 2013. Um, and they already had their aquatic theme. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm not going to, I have a great story, but I really can't tell it because it involved uh, stolen items. But let's just say that Camaro really looks good with these cool aquatic <laughs> pieces that somehow <laughs> mysteriously ended up uh, on their car that's hilarious <laughs> but uh so yeah we tried with vehicles we tried to keep in theme and then toward the the last two years we started bringing boats you know into you know carla uh made her war pig which is a 26 foot uh, fiberglass boat i painted up gray and uh-huh. and made it look like a rusty army boat and we yeah. had that that was great because originally we had the DJ up and the and all the works uh, controlling the music up uh-huh. on the ship. 
Um, now, originally, we didn't have any dance party or anything go on with the ship. Uh, 2015 was just a swimsuit contest. Uh-huh. And it was only later uh, when Adam and Jared uh, suggested it become part of the pit did then the ship became part of something that would happen at night too with bonfires and music. And what was great about the war pig is we then put the DJ booth out there where it was protected from water. And also uh-huh. they could overlook the, the crowd and that type of thing. And then oh, I think it. the last two years, we also brought in some small craft and put on either side and decorated it. Like they were, you know, everything was still in the sand and where people could just sit and lounge and and hang out. So so by the end it was a uh, it was quite a place. It, it really is a shame that our last year there was so windy that you know there wasn't nearly the crowd and and uh, people enjoying it as far as the night fires and that type of thing. But still yeah. it was out there. I think it looked the best it ever did that last year. Welcome to the 10th year of Wasteland Weekend post-apocalyptic bikini contest it was really neat to watch over the years as that like water world corner of wasteland kind of grew and grew um even to the point where um you had gregor's tower next door <laughs> yes oh i i tell we did not know that they were well i i think midway through 2019 we were introduced and um Oh, that was amazing. And that had very little to do with us, I have to say. And their creativity and what they did with their little atoll, uh, yeah. not so little, actually, uh, w- was amazing. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it, and they are, uh, I believe, going to be carrying the torch of <laughs> Waterworld for many years to come. Yeah. And, um, and right, it is a good torch to hand over. Um, yeah. You, yeah, cause I'll, um, I'll, yeah, I'll also be honest. Uh, I, I know, you know, I, I, I'm not the youngest <laughs> participant of Wasteland <laughs> Weekend. And toward toward the end, I have to say, it, it got rigorous. Now, part of it was because we're adding so much. Um, but also, it just got to a point where, you know, I started feeling, I mean, the, the swimsuits were amazing. You know, uh-huh. and, I, and I'm so glad that, uh, you know, it was, we opened it up to be all inclusive so anyone could participate. Yeah, because at first you were, you were, it was only girls at first. And then it was like there was a guy category and a girl category. And then I know in the later years, you just started doing everybody just competes together. Yeah. And, and that, that certainly came from both uh, Jared and Adam's desire and also other people had contacted me and wanted it opened up because, yeah. it, you know, it was rather narrow minded. You know, I mean, the truth of the matter is I'm old fashioned because I'm older <laughs> and. I wasn't as, uh, oh, just knowledgeable. It wasn't anything intentional. I just yeah. wasn't knowledgeable of of the cultural shifts that were happening or, uh-huh. you know, however social, whatever you want to name it. And But it was definitely the right thing to do. And yeah. the, the plus side to it is it opened up the contest to you know, to so many people that, that didn't feel they were invited to the contest, which is right. certainly was never, you know, my goal. And, um, yeah, and, and there were, I, I tended not to realize, not for any necessary reason other than I was just so involved with the project and, and I often saw it as a project. Um, I, I didn't realize at the time what it meant for people to participate mm-hmm. in the swimsuit contest. And, and sure, you know, there's, there's plenty of people that did it because it was just fun. Right. But there were also people and, you know, God bless their souls. It, you know, it took some bravery for them to get out, it, get up there. You know, right. it wasn't, you know, for, for some people, um, whether it be body positive imagery or whether it just be the challenge of getting in front of, a you know, hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh-huh. Um, it was interesting, you know, when all was said and done, where I get to have men and women comment on how much it meant for them to participate. And that was, uh, you know, that was a, a side value that I was unaware of really uh, that was even happening. Uh, right. You know, I was unaware of it to me where we were just putting on a show. Yeah. And when, and when you talk about like putting yourself out there, not only are you, um, are, are you, 
performing in front of this crowd. And I mean, it's hundreds by the later years of the D's. Um, but you know, you're also showing off more your body than most people normally do, except when they're at the beach. So, um, there's, there's not just the performance and your body, but you're also showing off the creativity that you put in this swimsuit. So, I mean, when you go on that stage, you're, you're just all out there. Exactly. And, and, and that's, uh, and it was always, I always felt, I never judged. And one of the reasons I, I didn't want to judge is I don't, and it's nothing against the, the concept of having a contest. Uh-huh. But for me, it was often, it would be hard for me to choose because once there's so much creativity going on. Right. And, um, you know, in all honesty, uh, I, there was a side of me who wish I'd say, okay, everyone's a winner. Now that just, it doesn't <laughs> work in that whole right. concept. But my feeling was if you got, you know, the guts and the creativity, because it takes something to make the costumes. You know, there, uh-huh. there are people who spent weeks. Some people spent months. I mean, there, there are people that really put the time in. And also, let's face it, we were doing our show on the Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. Uh-huh. And so not only did the people who showed up <laughs> to do the show, you know, they, they had you know, just many of them had to have the guts to do it or they did have the guts to do it and the commitment. But, you know, that's the commitment because uh, a lot of people partied hard on Friday night. We would have, you know, 150 on the list of performers and 70 would show up. And, I, and I'm not knocking anybody who didn't show up. I'm just saying, though. I was very clear early on what that commitment was to come out after partying all night on Friday night. Um, and then, and also 11 o'clock, a couple of the years, it was not the warmest mm-hmm. and, uh, and go out there and then get pelted with water. <laughs> you <know>? so, <laughs> right. so, you know, once again, it, it, it took more, and I didn't realize a lot of this till after the fact that it really took a lot for people to get up there. And, and uh, I know there are people have shared with me. They're proud they did it. And uh, that's great. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, it was so great. And um, and the crowd loved it, too. I mean, you, what an enthusiastic crowd that would always show up. And everybody gets cheered for. Everyone's getting having a good time. Um, and over the years, you guys really uh, amped up to the production value of this thing. I mean, by the end... There was, you had hosts, you had MCs, you had um, go-go dancers and music playing and um, and lots and lots of water guns. <laughs> yeah, and as, as you just ran through that list, my head was going, wow, did I do that? Followed by, oh, God, I did that. Because <laughs> um, it was a lot of work, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, we introduced water cannons during the show, shooting water up in the air. We had uh-huh. a bow-mounted water cannon. The last two years, we would open up the cannons after the show for anybody who wanted to dance. Every uh-huh. every year, we were always praying for heat. You know, I always <laughs> wanted a heat wave, no wind and heat. I yeah. wanted people red as lobsters, all you know, that needed water. That's what right. I wanted for them to all, to all show up. But yeah, the production value uh, certainly it, it kind of soared with the audience. The bigger the audience got the more we felt we needed to up our game. And, and, and for me, it was always, once again, and, and for the tribe is entertainment. So it was, okay, what can we do now? Um, right. And of course there's no running water on site. So it all has to be hauled in. Do you have any idea how many gallons of water you guys brought in? No, but you gave me a headache just now <laughs> thinking. So what we'd have to do and, and, you know, Jared and Adam, and I, I have to, I have to give them a call out, um, you know, cause it's their baby. Wasteland we, weekend is their show mm-hmm. and and rightfully so they control you know everything about it i uh, would i mean obviously tribes build the camps and all that but for us because we were in you know on the other side of the wall you know they they were really hands-off uh-huh. um in regards to everything that we did now i would obviously run by you know mainly adam i'd run things by him Uh And then if he said no, it it was no, it was no problem there. But in all honesty, there was a lot of freedom that allowed us to amp up everything. Um, Mm -hmm. But water, we had to (laughs) be friends. (laughs) We we had to work with them because they had the wrench that opened up the fire hydrant. So (laughs) originally we wanted a water truck to fill up our tanks, but come to find out – even though the water was clean in the water trucks, there was always 
you oh, could there right. was no way you could uh make because they're watering the roads with it they yeah. weren't providing water for drinks all that there was right. no way to make sure at the time it might be different now but the bacteria was in it so right. we have but where the fire hydrants uh, apparently that's good water yeah so we'd have to go into california city with a flatbed trailer and we had our big uh white containers and we would then fill them up and then we'd have to you know gratefully wasteland would bring over a forklift and forklift those <laughs> those big containers of water down oh wow and um i couldn't tell you how much water we went through i just i just know it was a lot and that you know the dance party kind of afterwards after the show kind of came out of the what are we going to do with all this with all this water all the extra yeah yeah and 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 dale uh one of our crew members dale uh, I'm trying to, I really should use their tribe names, but you know, they, <laughs> they all float away from my head now. Um, but Dale was a welder. Dale and Leon were our main welders on the whole camp and they saved us many times, but Dale was the one that got a hold of the big water cannon. Got and, it. um, oh. that did really, I, I loved that thing. I, I didn't jump up and actually spray it as much as I should have because uh-huh. that was, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, that was really great. And, I, I, and it's really fun how um, as you get involved and as you're like giving back to the community, they start giving back back to you. Um, like when the Dukes of the Nuke, when our sign got destroyed in a in a, uh, a moving accident, <laughs> uh, <laughs> people just showed up with letters that year and we had enough letters to make a new sign. Um, so it's really great that when people like what you're doing, they'll support you any way they can. Yeah, I, I agree. And I've, and there's been some, you know, just personal surprises. And I wish I could remember the gentleman's name, but this one guy came up and he just pulls this long sword out that he had made. <laughs> I mean, dangerous as hell, this thing. And I tried to wear it. Um, for uh, the show. And the fact is, I, I could stab two or three guests, you know, in backstage easily just by turning around. <laughs> um, so I never really was able to wear it, but it is, it's, it's hung up on a wall in my house. I got a little room that's kind of got some pirate stuff, just as, you know, memories and stuff. And I have it uh-huh. in the room. But it was just so cool that he, he went, he put in the effort to do that. And, and there were various uh, nautical and pirate trinkets and items given to the tribe members, including myself throughout the years. And the, just people who appreciated, you know, what we had done. And, and once again, that wasn't something we, that wasn't a goal. Hey, let's get all the booty we can. And booty, uh-huh. I mean, treasure. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and yet, you know, there, you know, people would show their appreciation. And, and that was, that was great. Over the years, uh, the D's was on site for, what, 15 to 19, so five years. Um, the D's suffered some pretty extreme wear and tear. Can you describe the uh, slow demise of the trailers? Yeah, yeah. Now now's the sad part of the story. Feel free to cut in some violins in the background. <laughs> so the D's, you know, it was great the way we built it. Um, because it's what we had to do to build it. Yeah. Um, the wooden structure inside, obviously. Um, we would have much preferred to use metal, but we just didn't have the funds at uh-huh. all. So what happened, especially the last two years, is, is is quite simple. The weight of all the metal and siding it started sliding down our our structure. Oh wow. Uh, start breaking bolts and cracking wood at the same time because it was stored out in the desert and when i say stored and it sat there was we couldn't (laughs) cover it it was it was too big to cover Uh uh-huh well all that wood is uh you know even though there's not a lot of rain there's enough rain out in the desert that it would go through these wet and dry cycles and the wood was just starting to dry rot Uh um and really it was it was for safety It, it, it just got to a point where you know we it was never unsafe i I have to make clarify that it wasn't Uh like the last year there everyone was risking their (laughs) lives um but there was an acknowledgement that yeah this might not last another year and in reality i have absolutely no doubt that we made the right decision Uh you know because of covid and no wasteland in 2020 right yeah Uh, and god willing there'll be one in 2021 but Uh that the the ship would not have been able to survive to 2021 got it 
without major structural reinforcement. And uh -huh. um, we, you know, there was a side of, of me that I was thinking, well, gee, maybe we could raise money and get more metal and do it all over again. But by that time, some tribe members had moved on. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, it was getting grueling uh, doing what we're doing. Um, there was some brief discussion on maybe handing the boat over and letting somebody else uh, deal with it. Uh -huh. But uh, my tribe members uh, were pretty adamant that, no, you know, this is our baby and, and we'll, you know, we'll go down with the ship type of mentality, which, oh, yeah. you know, and I do understand that. I, I, I get uh, one person in particular said, you know, I don't want to be walking through Wasteland Weekend and turn around and see the boathouse yeah, you know, bolted to somebody else's camp. Uh huh. And and I got it. And yeah. uh, you know, so it just it was something because of the and when we would haul this boat, by the way, when we go down the dirt roads, you'd follow behind it, and the 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 entire thing was shifting on the trailer. I mean, it was just very <laughs> obvious that it wasn't structurally, it wasn't going to be structurally sound in a year or two. Right. Um. Wasteland is in this, you know, because we're a tribe, Wasteland can't help us, which is under, you know, understandable. Uh -huh. And, you know, there were thoughts that they had talked about, oh, maybe we'll build another boat and, and all that type of thing. Uh -huh. Not, but not with our stuff. And, and I understand that it still uh -huh. makes, you know, wh whatever they decide to do in the future, it's better to start with their own metal that's new. And, um, you know, this, this tin siding, as I pointed out when we talked about movie cars, the D's is the same thing. The D's was never meant to survive as long as it did. They didn't care. I mean, it, <laughs> right. it's, it's metal. Yeah. The metal was stapled or nail gun to thin sheets of Luan wood and uh -huh. then and then screwed onto a metal frame. This thing was was and it's amazing it did last as long as it did. And right. our boat, you know, in hindsight, probably it's amazing it lasted five years. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, so ultimately the decision was made that we would uh, you know, put it to rest. Um Wasteland was kind and kind enough to assist us. We decided to take it apart on site and part of the reason was i did have my doubts not once again not necessarily the structural side of things um as far as people getting up there was no problem there but when that boat went down the dirt road and the fact that it wanted to shift off the trailer uh -huh. that that gave my biggest concern after wasteland week in 2019 is if we tried to get it off site we might have issues gotcha. so that's what that's what we why we kind of decided to do it right there on site um we did strip the metal off the boat um uh -huh. i i have uh, some pieces um so we did save some of it um i know wasteland at the time had talked about doing some kind of memorial uh mm -hmm. whether that happens or not is yet to be seen and uh -huh. you know either way you know, if they do something i'll i'll uh i'll welcome it but in the same token um if they don't they don't um that's just that's just it um there has been talk about uh i i do have the back plates so i believe you know with the name of the boat on it so i believe what will happen is someday they will end up going to wasteland weekend every year for people to see them you know i'm hoping oh, that's there's good. some kind yeah. of whether it be a wasteland museum which i you know there could be something like that it might just be a place whether i'm there or not you know regardless you know a place where people can still see the the actual plates from the movie and you know and that type of thing so right. in one way shape or form you know, these will still have a piece of itself out there i believe uh -huh. good um now you know the sadly uh, i don't believe the ghost of fish dick will make another uh, appearance <laughs> um you know he I, I think I think the ghost of Fish Dick was really tied to the D's. Uh -huh. I, I believe it, it's really what brought him from the depths of the sand where he died after he was bitten in the groin by a fish. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I don't think Fish Dick is going to. 
make another appearance. And for those that don't know, Fishstick is um, a, a guy in like a, what, circa 1900s uh, scuba set exactly. um, with, a, with an actual like literal cod piece. <laughs> yeah, well, he ha- he has a skeleton of a fish bit yeah. into his crotch. And the rumor, <laughs> the, the, the legend has it, back when the seas were full of water before it all dried up, uh, he was down, uh, you know, God knows why he was using this old aquatic stuff. Um, probably, you know, much like the Mariner did in Waterworld, searching the cities for stuff. He was right. down below searching for loot. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's just a very hungry fish, apparently. Yeah. And it looked like a worm, and bam, there again. And then he, he died, and then the <laughs> oceans dried up, and his ghost came from the sands. And I guess just wanted to party. Yeah. I mean, that's all, you know, every, every swimsuit contest, he showed up always uh-huh. interrupting, mm-hmm. you know, the last year, I don't know if you recall, but I actually posted guards on the platforms to keep fish dick from, uh, showing up, but then some rowdy demolition, uh, girls decided to break up the party and fish dick made another appearance, but I, I don't believe that will that will happen again. And gotcha. to this day, we have no idea who fish dick is, was. <laughs> Where he came from, he will, uh, you know, much like uh, Mad Max, he will exist only in our memories. So the last time that the D's was put up was in 2019. What was it like to put up the D's stage for the last time? Uh, that's a great question. Well, putting the D's up the last time, and I, I'll be honest, I, I we had by that time even decided that this would most likely be the last year. Um, so it was bittersweet. There, there's no denying it. Uh-huh. It, like always, was a lot of work. <laughs> and um, so... So that that offset, you know, it wasn't like I was in tears um, at the time, you know, putting it up. But it's that weird sense um, of knowing something was going to end, something great. Right. Um, you know, and I'm getting a lump in my throat just thinking about it now. I mean, yeah. just the you know, the the last you know, the last crowd in 2019 was huge. Yeah. I mean, the amount of people and, and, and that's with wind and dust and dirt and, and just the <laughs> amount of people that showed up and contestants. I think we topped out. I want to say we had 79 wow. participant, you know, contestants participate. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was just bittersweet. There's always this level of sadness underneath. And it wasn't just me. There, there were other tribe members though, who I know were not wanting to see it end, but also knowing that. You know, it was the thing to do. Right. Um, certainly, it was rough. It was rough for two reasons when we were cutting apart the boat. One was, like I said, the weather was just not the most conducive for celebration uh-huh. around the boat. So we kind of felt like we didn't get give the boat a proper send off just by you know not having the night parties and that type of thing. Uh-huh. Also, we didn't really share with anybody that we were going to take the boat apart, and that just had to do with, you know, I I believe other people. In fact, I know other people were sad that to learn that it was, you know, was gone. So, you know, we didn't want people to be feeling sad. I mean, it's an event we're still entertainers, so we didn't really uh, say too much. So then, cutting the boat, the boat apart was rough. I remember um, you had reached out to me a little bit before Wasteland 2019 to say, you know, hey, would is there any chance you'd be up for making a documentary about the D's? And I was like, man, I want to, but uh, you know, I'll be too busy for that. Um, I wish I had been able to spend some more time over there because I didn't know that it was the last year until uh, I think it was Sunday. And I look over and you guys were pulling the metal off the frame. And then a couple hours later, uh, a bonfire. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And in all honesty, I probably I think when I called you, we weren't quite deciding what we were going to do. In all honesty, I probably should have should have contacted you again and said, hey, we're going to this is gone. Yeah. But, you know. Once again, there's there's so much going on in just putting it all together. And ultimately, 
just we decided uh, that it was something we just kind of keep to our, close to our chest until we started taking it apart. Yeah, I and mean, there is some video floating out there of of swimsuit contests and some really great drone footage, so it, it does uh-huh. live on. Yeah, yeah, it, I, I think it'll uh, it'll it'll definitely um, be a part of Wasteland forever, even though uh, not everyone will get to experience it because we have a lot of new Wastelanders coming in. And, and oh yeah, you know it's a. Uh, it's always like a well. That's what's really nice about Wasteland too is it is really organic and and depending on which tribes come, um, they they can completely change the event because it is very uh, participant created and so you know it's it is something that'll always be a little bit different for that. Yeah, and I do I do think that that things do need to change and keep evolving. Um, you know, certainly the fact that it was the ten year anniversary. There was a sense also of of, of a, inviting the younger participants, the new participants, yeah. to to now okay, okay, it's your turn. I mean, got like I said, the atoll that was built beside us, and that that uh-huh. tribe is, you know, <laughs> filled with tremendously <laughs> younger people. God bless them. And I, you know, the, the mind boggling thing about it though is, I could not have built that. I mean, you know, I I dragged a ship out. You know, we had our own world that we created, uh-huh. but I couldn't begin to do what they did and and that's the 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 plus side of um in a way of out with the old in with the new because there's just new things that can be discovered and new things that can be built and you know i i hope someday there's another boat out there or a shipwreck or something or a sunken submarine or you know who knows i mean it's it's up to the new people are coming in young people that are you know latching onto these franchises and you know they have the freedom to do what they want and uh it's going to be great to see what they do um, right yeah. as the event evolves yeah okay so it sounds like the d's uh it sounds like there's no chance of this thing getting rebuilt so what would you say is your next plan for wasteland do you have like a, a next build in mind or does the tribe live on uh what's what's next for you guys that is uh, a loaded question. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. I the the tribe. I won't say the tribe. Well, yeah, the tribe's dissolved, but we're okay. still friends. I mean, yeah. you know, and and perhaps someday, um, if I do decide if if a project comes up that I feel I want to put my time into, I I have no qualms about inviting people that I've been with before if they have the same passion for whatever thing uh-huh. I might come up with um, to do to invite them on board, no pun intended. Uh-huh. But in the same token, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, Cause I mean, there, when there is some sadness in knowing that the boat isn't there. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly I don't have a replacement and I don't, not for the boat. I mean, I mean, I don't have a replacement for, you know, what, what do I want wasteland weekend to look like for me and my participation in, uh-huh. in the years to come. Um, I might even take a year or two off. Uh, Cause I do, I do enjoy the creativity of it. I, I'm not the type of person to really go to an event like that um, and not be, have an artistic uh, uh, thing going on, you know, whether uh-huh. it be a, whether it be a wasteland car or a ship, you know, I, I need yeah. to have some object of, of, of that. I have my passion directed toward, and I don't know what that is yet. Um, so I'm kind of uh, up in there and open and uh-huh. uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, the one thing that, that is great, is I'm, I've made such great friends through Wasteland and I obviously uh-huh. keep in touch with them. And, um, and I know that there's possibilities in that, you know, cause other people are going to start putting together tribes or building some other crazy thing. And uh-huh. so I might, I might get involved with, with somebody else's project, which I yeah. have no qualms about. Um, so yeah, right now the future's kind of open. I am hoping that uh, obviously we have Wasteland Weekend 2021. Re- regardless of what I decide to do, I hope the event's able to to happen, as I know many of us are. Uh-huh. And um, regardless of when it comes back, I have no doubt that there's going to be a ton of creativity and some you know really cool stuff that people are going to bring to the event, like they do every year. Yeah, and maybe you'll get to take a year and you know kind of see Wasteland with fresh eyes, almost like. Almost like a newbie. It sounds like you know if you don't have the the uh, the D's to work on, you might be able to 
go and explore some more or, um, you know, get inspired in a different way. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. In fact, that's been shared, uh, with me, the fact that from the get go, you know, I would say in the second year that, which would be the first line, that first year, actually wasteland weekend, I believe I was car coordinator then. So I've always been doing something, uh-huh. Uh, in a pseudo official capacity connected with wasteland. And, and I honestly have never just gone and sat in a lawn chair with a <laughs> stay off my lawn sign stuck in the dirt, <laughs> a 50 caliber and, you know, mounted on a tripod beside me and just watch yeah. the world go by. So right. you're right. It, that, that is an option and that might be something I just might do. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, outside of Wasteland, you've definitely picked up a new project. Um, you started a new YouTube channel called Miller's Movie Carp Madness. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what you're doing with that show? Yeah, essentially, uh, for those of you who know, or those of you who don't know, I have a 1951 fiberglass Merc. It went out to Wasteland Weekend, uh, I think 2013, 2014. Yeah. And uh, at that time, it had missiles where the headlights were or machine guns. I had interchangeable parts and that type of thing. I also wrote a feature film that it needs a car like uh, the Mercury, but not uh, post-apocalyptic. So I'm currently changing the car to become a movie car for the film that I wrote. And uh, to do it, to make the changes, I have to make a lot of fiberglass parts. Um, interior pieces i have a lot of different building you know pieces to build so mm-hmm. i decided to make miller's movie car madness as kind of like tutorials on how i'm building parts also touching upon uh movie cars i've built in the past i've done a few for short films uh-huh. so that's really what the channel does it's like hey i'm building a car for a movie and check it out the first episode is all about wasteland uh-huh. um and it, that i think that uh takes it up to uh the first uh, three episodes take us up to now to nowadays so in other words yeah you'll see through video and still photos the evolution of the car when i got it to now and then it picks up where I'm starting to transition it more into this this movie car. And I, I will say, um, if you're a wastelander and you want to build things out of fiberglass or want to learn how to uh, carve things in styrofoam and even paint, um, you know, I touch on those type of subjects. So, you know, you're certainly invited to check out every uh, check out the channel every uh, month. I put out a new episode. Um, this month is, uh, I made a rear window insert using various techniques. And, uh, actually I think this is the first real disaster episode that will be coming out. <laughs> I have never had more problems building a single car part in my life that, oh, wow. that happened on this. And also uh, for better or worse, my tutorials probably suck, um, <laughs> in that, I, I, I decide instead of like a bland tutorial, this is how you do it. Da, 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 da. No, I decide I'm going to be an entertainer. Uh Um, so yeah, each episode is different and strange and yeah. So I gotta gotta say, I've I've been following along and you're, the show is very entertaining. You've got a nice mix of like tutorial and, um, like behind the scenes, uh, and, and you are hysterical. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's really, it's really fun to watch. Yeah, I, like I said, it, it's interesting because when I go online, if I have to learn how to, because I I will learn how to do fiberglass and stuff online, you know, from other people. Uh-huh. It's great because I get information. But I can't say that if there's somebody else out there who wants to do fiberglass and just wants straight up answers, my uh, channel is the best. Because no, <laughs> you're you're seeing the moment where I spilled my Coca Cola that I then blow up into a full movie scene. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, but if you're trying to figure out how to add resin to Catalyst, yeah, you're kind of screwed. So, <laughs> so I don't know, but you know, I'm, I'm slowly but surely gaining, uh, you know, people. Uh, for those of you out there who like going to YouTube and checking out channels, please know that when you subscribe and like, it, it's, it's not us desperate for people per se, but what it does do is it helps uh, the YouTube channel uh, put your video out more so that more yeah. people see it. And, yep. you know, just like uh, the D's tribe was an entertainment tribe, I see these, you know, as far as what I do on the U- my little YouTube channel is entertainment. So, yeah. you know, it's just spreading the word. Like I said, it, it may not be the best tutorial, although, like I said, you will learn and you'll see 
you know, how I'm doing things um, and building the car. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is. Thank you for pointing out that it's fun. Cause that is, yeah. uh, is my goal. Yeah. I've really, I've really been loving watching. Um, I'll put a link to the channel in the show notes, uh, in the, in the uh, description, wherever that happens to land, wherever you're listening. Um, is there anywhere else people can follow along with like your movie career? Um, yeah, I have a Paul C. Miller film page. Uh, so you can certainly, uh, Facebook friend me on that and I awesome. make little little updates on my projects uh, essentially my car is being made for a feature film I wrote called Speed Demon Very good. and uh, so that's that's the one project and then I have another project that's in transition um, that's a short film that uh, kind of has like a young James Bond type of character so so I have two projects that I post up on my Paul C. Miller uh, film page and, um, yeah, so please you know, feel free to check it out. And then, like I said, uh, Miller's Movie Car Madness on YouTube, you can subscribe. And then every month you'll see another, uh, another video. And, um, the last one that I just put up, I announced that I'm cutting the entire roof off my car. <laughs> so that is going to be an entertaining next few months because I honestly, you know, this isn't like those, as I point out in the video, this isn't like those uh, car building uh, shows on TV where they make fake drama to keep you mm -hmm. watching. And, oh, will this car turn out? Yeah. Now, mine's real drama. I spent the money and I have no <laughs> idea. I have no idea if the roof's going to fit. I have no idea if my ideas on how to make it fit are going to work. I uh -huh. really am suspect that maybe they won't work. You know, so, yeah, but I can guarantee it will be fun. You know, I might end up in a straight jacket, but uh -huh. still, it, it will be fun to watch. <laughs> well, knowing your work from the past, I know you're going to get it on there, whether it's held on with uh, super glue <laughs> or duct tape. <laughs> yeah, I'll get that sucker in there somehow. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, Paul, it's been um, such a treat to be able to talk to you and get the full story of the D stage and learn a little bit more about what you've got going on. Thanks so much for coming on. Well, absolutely. And thank you for having me on. And I just want to take a moment to, you know, thank the entire crew of the D's because you wouldn't have, you know, this interview wouldn't be happening. I wouldn't have gotten to be a captain of a broken fake ship in the desert. <laughs> um, and all the participants who did get the chance to enjoy, uh, you know, the wasteland weekend, post-apocalyptic swimsuit contest and the pit and all that, that, that wouldn't have happened were it not for the tribe and, and for all the other people who, donated money and dedicated time into making it. So I want to thank them. And then I, you know, for everyone out there who are wastelanders and, you know, thank you very much for uh, what you do, your creativity, yeah. your passion, your, what drives the event. And, um, it's it's great to see, and I look forward to seeing you out there. Yeah, it truly does take an apocalyptic village to uh, <laughs> <laughs> do this kind of stuff. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much. All right. You have a good one. I'll see you next time. Hey, Survivors, thanks so much for listening to this interview with Paul Miller. I hope you guys had a good time. I'm going to leave a few links in the show notes for you today. One is going to be Paul's YouTube channel where you can see Miller's Movie Car Madness, that new channel we talked about. I'll also leave a link to his short film, Mad Max Renegade. And I did manage to dig up a very short video I made of that first wet t-shirt contest that Paul put on uh, before the D stage was even a thing. I'll link that as well. And that'll about wrap it up for this week. The Apocalypse Postcast, a podcast, is produced by Mike Makeshift Darling with support from our Patreon supporters, including producer Paul Waldrop. Make sure to smash that subscribe button wherever you're listening. And if you liked this episode, share it with your friends. And if you hated it, send it to your enemies via intercontinental ballistic missile. Until next time, survivors, stay alive. Ten days and ten, ten days, ten days and ten days.